Hey, Greg, what's happening? Morning. Welcome. Welcome, everyone. All you fellow stock market people. Welcome to the Everyday Trader. Eric, it's good to be with you. Yeah, it's good to be here. Uh, this time of year, the sun comes around the backside and I get this glow behind me. So it's <laughs> coming in that window up there. So I look a little funny on camera here, but thanks for joining us for another uh, Everyday Trader. This is Today's the day before Thanksgiving. Um, today's the 23rd of November, 2022. Um, we just wanted to check in. It's a holiday shortened week. We tend to have low volume this week. Um, there are some things to talk about though. So we thought we'd check in with just a quick little update for everybody. Before we, get too, before we get too far, thank you for your likes, your subscribes, your comments. Please remember to do that. If you're new to us, click on that little bell down there, subscribe to us. We will... Uh, Try to provide some good content, some timely content of what we feel is going on in the market and maybe a few other things as well. So a couple things going on today. We had uh, really good numbers from John Deere today. Uh, stocks just jumping this morning. Uh, John Deere. Oh, that's not John Deere. That's Tesla. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, who knows? Maybe we can John Deere moving in. I actually read some interesting stuff about uh, John Deere is test piloting uh, electric tractors right now. And the test pilots were just absolutely destroying the idea of an electric tractor versus a diesel tractor, um, mostly because of timing and charging of batteries. And anyone who any anyone who's listening who grew up on a farm, I did is know that. The number one factor when it comes to the harvest and farm is that weather plays a major impact. And if there are some times when you have a window as a, of a farmer that you have to operate your tractor, your, your tractor is going for 14 days straight, 24 seven, to be able to get the crop out of the field. And unfortunately from a battery charging standpoint, that's what they've been running into with these electric versions of tractors is they just can't keep the batteries going when the window for your harvest has to happen. So as much as I want to say, we're going to eventually be able to completely eliminate fossil fuels. I think the farming industry is going to have to keep putting diesel engines in John Deere's so that we can eat, so that we can eat. But Hey, <laughs> I know that was a really weird tangent about yeah, John was. Deere and Tesla. You had Tesla up on the screen. I had to go with it. Yeah. There you um, go. Deer's earnings were awesome. Um, and to me, this speaks to the year that the farmers just had. Uh, we've had record commodity prices for the last year uh, across the board, too. It wasn't like it was just corn that was really high. I mean, we had corn and soybeans and wheat and potatoes and sugar and almost anything you can think of that American farmers and worldwide farmers, for that matter, but specifically American farmers that they grow, we had record prices and they locked in um, their, their contracts. And a lot of the farmers that I know had record profitability years too. And so one of the things that a farmer usually does when they have record profit years is they go buy new tractors because those things are not indefinite. They do have a shelf life and they're a really big line item from an expense standpoint. So when they've got the money to do it, they go buy tractors. And so John Deere's uh, I think Caterpillar's earnings showed a similar thing a month or so ago uh, that they had record sales as well. And so John Deere, uh, yeah, posted a really good number. I think there's yeah, so John still Deere momentum beat, here. They beat um, on uh, forecasts. So they, they did well from what was expected in actual sales, but uh, they also had a very positive uh, outlook. They expect um, to have a uh, pretty significant growth running out through 2023, which I think bodes well um, overall for the economy. Now we've, we're getting mixed signals here and there throughout um, you know, various different data, uh, but, but I think there's, there's still reason to um, you know, be positive here. As we've seen uh, positive signs from the retail. We talked to you and I before we started recording, we talked a little bit about uh, retail earnings this week um, that we're seeing some pretty good results on some of the different retailers. 
Thoughts yeah, I was using I was using the analogy of it's like people started going back to the mall again. I mean, if you look at a lot of the retailers that reported really solid earnings in the last week or two, it's companies like Foot Locker uh, and and Best Buy and Dick Sporting Goods and Abercrombie and Fitch and American, American Eagle, Eagle Outfitters, Outfitters. Right? Uh, Urban Outfitters. I mean, a lot of those companies that you know, for the last, you know, prior to COVID, people were writing the mall off as dead. And, you know, you don't want to have your retail store at the mall anymore. And everyone was trying to move to online shopping. And I'm not saying that trend is going away. But I think some of this, and I, I threw this out to you before we were talking, is how much of this is a rebound from COVID? Not only do consumers have still a little bit of extra money in their savings and some availability on their credit cards right now but they also have uh, just this pent-up feeling of i've been in covid lockdown for two years i'm gonna go to the mall i could probably save a little money and buy this on amazon but i want to get out and go walk around yeah i think i think it's um it's interesting but there's a little bit of dichotomy we're having the same discussion a week ago um, talking about Walmart and Target. And I, I think more and more when I look back at it, I think that what we saw in Target was really a, a reflection of probably mismanagement um, that some of the other retailers have done well and, and Target um, sort of missing the mark. Um, and we're hearing reasons that, you know, they're, they're just not having the right products that, that people want. Um, so hopefully there's some shifts that are going there because the evidence seems to be that the consumer spending and the consumer, like I said, is, is, um, feels, uh, comfortable. I think part of that is, you know, um, home sales. That was the other thing we talked about here. Um, you and I, uh, that we saw some recent, uh, upgrades by analysts, um, over the past 24 hours on the various home builders. Yeah, I'm a little mixed on that one because, you know, I know the home builders have been just absolutely beaten to death this year. Um, and across the board from Pulte to Lennar to Toll Brothers, unit DR Horton. I mean, the big nationwide home builders have really been hammered on, of course, rising mortgage rates. Uh, and mortgage rates have contributed um, a lot to the negative performance of these houses. And I know I've Quoted even a few weeks ago, you know, a big a home builder in Utah who had a horrible month last month, um, and so I'm 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 torn on this. I get it that they're really down, and it's you know you usually want to be buying stocks when they're down. You want to see upgrades when they're towards 52 week lows. I just don't know. Looking into next year, unless we see mortgage rates top out and the Fed stops raising rates, I just think mortgage rates are going to continue to climb, which still put negative pressure on these. So maybe I'm wrong here and JP Morgan's right. Um, and this is a good time to enter home builders, but I'm skeptical on this one. I think people should be putting home builders on the radar. I think the narrative of, you know, higher Fed funds rate leads to higher mortgages, impact sales. I, I happen to think that that's pretty well broadcasted and maybe maybe priced in. I used to trade Lennar quite a bit um, a, a while ago, um, sort of waiting long-term, um, waiting for it to find a bottom here. Let me pop up a five-year chart. Oh, this is KB. Home. That's KB. Um, but Lennar, I mean, the chart's very similar for both of them. Um, so we are near uh, multi-year low. We go back to COVID, what happened post-COVID. Um, I wouldn't be very bullish from here, certainly, but seeing the upgrades was nice and, and notable. And I said, like I said, that goes sort of hand in hand with, you know, what we've been talking about here that the consumer is, is probably stronger than, um, than maybe what we, where they thought they would be. That being said, we do have reasons to be not cheerful. Uh, if we take a look at some of the other data that's out there. And I'm thinking about our friend, Jim Bianco, who tweeted um, yesterday, a really great tweet on uh, the inversion of the yield curve, which is something that you and I have been talking about for a long time. It's something we've been looking at for, I don't know, decade or longer as an indicator. And I do think that the three month, um, the actually the 10 year minus the three month is the indicator to look at. 
And, well, there's just so many years of data, and this is what Bianco referenced in his tweet thread here. There's there's so many years of data of looking at the three month and the ten year that you can look back at, and it is now eight for eight. Uh, we're we're not in a scenario where it's right most of the time, but when you have a ten day span where the three month and 10 year have been inverted, which we just did yesterday. We finally got 10 consecutive days where that, that yield curve has been inverted. It's now eight for eight in predicting recessions over the last 50 years. Let's contrast that. So, just a lot of people talk about the two and the 10 year. Um, and I don't, know, I don't know why. I think it's because we just have a lot more data. We have data going back before 69 on the two and the 10. So I just think it was something that got written in a textbook in the 70s and just never got deleted. Uh, but the, I think the three months, now that we have significant amount of data, that the, the 10 year and the three month. And the reason for this is there's the yield curve is a... Um, it, what it is is looks at all the different treasuries for different expirations and looks at the yield. So a high yield means lower price. So you're getting better return. It means there's less demand uh, on the front end of the curve. And that's you know here's the here's a simple graph that looks at the just the ten year minus the three month. I, I think a better way to look at it. And you know I get a little nerdy sometimes. Uh, this this is the actual surface of the yield curve. And it's about 10 megabytes. It's going to take a second to refresh here for me. Uh, let me get this thing and manipulate it around. So you can think of this like a mountain range. Um, here we are in this uh, zero interest rate policy that we had you know, starting in 2009 after the global financial crisis. So we had zero Fed funds rate. We started to raise rates uh, in the end of 2015 through 16. We had a yield curve inversion that happened. It's interesting that the inversion actually happened in February 2019, uh, broadcasting that we could have, um, a if you use this as a recession indicator, uh, the reason we gave credit to the recession was because of uh, COVID. So when COVID broke in February 2020 and the Fed started cutting rates back down to zero, um, I, I was, you and I both argue that we were going to have a recession anyways. And when I look at this, I'm sort of manipulating this graph around it. I don't know if you can see it, uh, the, that we've got this sort of straight pointing forward, uh, higher at the front curve, you know, more notable, um, is the big recession that we had in, in 2006, um, where we had the similar type curve where the, the front end was very steep and we had this sort of orderly straight line. And if you go back to 2001, the data gets a little wonky here because we don't have all the expirations that we have. So my, my data gets a little wonky. We definitely see the front end much higher than the longer term. If we look at this edge of the curve, what's happening right now, and this is up to date, this is data as of yesterday, uh, we don't have, we do definitely have a yield inverted yield curve with the front end being lower. Um, but I think there might be a different story here. And may, I'm not arguing that we're not going to have a recession. I do think there's other reasons to think we're going to have a recession. Let me skip over to that, first of all. And that is here's the Fed funds rate. This is the, you know, if, if we look at historically what's happened, the Fed raises, the gray bars are recession. <laughs> they raise until we have a recession. I mean, there's no question that that's what's going to happen is uh, we raise until we see a recession. If we look back at modern history, though, this sort of lines up with Bianco's inverted yield curve sort of notion that, and, and this is, you know, the Fed funds rate is part of the reason why the yield curve inverts. Um, it, we still have a good year or so out before the recession actually happens. So my argument is that we we need to be worried about, if you look at all these curves, the modern, modern ones, it's when they start cutting. We talked about this on the Options Animal Weekly last week. It's when the rate, when the Fed funds rate levels off and then starts dropping down that that we need to worry. So I'm I'm in the camp that, yes, we're going to have a recession, um, I think it's a year out and maybe we see it at the end of 2023, I would say 75% probability by 2024, we're going to be in a recession, but I think we can make a case that there's going to be smooth sailing from here. You yeah. I'm not, a, 
I don't necessarily disagree with you. I think for at least from now until the end of the year, maybe even through the first part of January, I think we could see some uh, some bullish movement. I'm not going to call it anything more than that. I'm not going to call it a new bull trend. I'm I'm not even calling the end of our current bear market. To be honest, I still think that our bear market we're going to when we when it when we finally bottom and say it's over we're going to look back and say that it started in November December of 2021 is when it started and so i don't think it's over yet but i agree with you that i think the likely path of the markets in the short term the next 30 60 90 days are probably to the upside uh as we kind of rebalance a little bit maybe we see some shift away from some of the stocks that are more recession um, exposed, uh, particularly global recession exposed. I think that's one of the things that we're starting to see is this this movement away from you know some of the tech names, uh, particularly in, in some of the hedge funds that are out there. I know there was a report that you and I were looking at before um, that that has been talking about this transition away from companies like Meta and into companies like John Deere. Uh, as an example, we already talked about today. But the other reason why I think we still are in a bear market and why I don't think we've we've hit bottom yet uh, is that the S&P 500's median earnings during a bear market as a, 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 is at about a 13 price to earnings ratio during the bear market, right? I mean, that's not its long-term average, right? We're still at about 21 on the S&P's um, PE ratio. So I still think there's a little more downside um, in whether it's price or earnings fixes the PE ratio. I'm not sure. I think it's going to be price. So I think I agree with Bianco. I still think there's there's risk in the, the second half of next year, maybe even as early as in the summer of next year, uh, where we start to see maybe we'll really get a sell in May and go away scenario uh, in the second half of next year. Um, I don't know what's going on with my internet, but I'm bringing, I'm bringing it to the knees of whatever I'm doing, if it's the streaming or what, hopefully that quality is good, but here's a long-term chart of the S and P 500 PE ratio. And depending on which source you look at in the date, this is close enough. Um, you said we're about 21. So there we are. Yeah. And historically, that's, that's, that's about right. Um, and you know, just a year ago we were up in the thirties, which is ironic because I, do you remember what it was like when we were there and, People like you and I were saying, listen, these these are unsustainable PE levels. But people say, oh, no, this is the new normal. This is the new normal. Yeah. Chamath, yeah. Chamath said it is, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that I mean, it's 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 interesting the human behavior how we tend to rationalize where we're at, and, and I think if you look back historically, we're we're a little bit lower than where we've been over the past thirty years. Now, this graph goes back to eighteen seventy or something like that, which is interesting. I don't know how much credence you can give to that, but I think looking back to the past thirty years. Uh, we're somewhat normal. And your point is completely valid that um, if we are entering into a bear market, um, we probably would see something down around 15. And yeah, that's kind of the target I'm looking at. It's about a 15 before I'm going to say, OK, we've now sold off enough based on earnings to say we're, we're at a bottom. I think you're right. And I think we've priced in a lot of the interest rate cuts already. I think we've priced in some of the external factors that maybe inflation has been doing to to um, to the consumer. What I don't think is priced in yet is what these inflationary pressures are going to do to corporate earnings. And that will be the interesting trend. So far this earnings season, I'm actually very pleased. The one we just wrapped up uh, for the most part, I know there were some stocks, you know, if you were there with Meta's earnings and going through Meta, that, that was an awful earnings report. But arguably, it's some of those stocks, you know, the metas of the world, there's just a handful of them out there that are still really expensive. I know you and I are both fanboys, but Apple's expensive right now. Well, I was, I got my other numbers over here. Um, Apple PE currently is running somewhere around um, 24. Last year it was at 32. Um, historically, though, Apple, you know, always never seemed to 
get the same sort of multiple that um, uh, it, it deserved, or at least that we felt it deserved. If you look up until 2019, for the previous decade, the average was 15.6 a PE ratio. So currently it's 24. So you're right. I think Apple probably does have room um, to potentially um, pull back. Um, not that any of us want to see that. <laughs> I'm I'm just long shares right now on Apple. So I, I don't have any uh, collar trade or anything. So um, I think you look at Microsoft, it's a similar story. It's still at like a 26, 28 PE ratio. I mean, Amazon, even though it's had a horrible year, is still at an 86 PE ratio. I mean, some of these big mega cap tech names are still pulling a relatively high valuation. And I'm not saying that the valuation of Amazon and Apple have to be the same as the valuation of Goldman Sachs. Uh, I'm not saying, or Exxon Mobil. They, they do generate a greater uh, rate of return on their, uh, on their cash, but I still think that's where our biggest risk is are these big mega cap heavyweights that have been hedge funds holdings for a long time. Yeah, that's another thing we talked about before the show. We wanted to share, uh, there's a uh, release earlier this week from Goldman Sachs um, where they looked at the 13F filing. So these are filings that need to be done. If you've got over a hundred million in, in trading, you have to file with the SEC um, Whale Wisdom is a really good website for looking at that. But Goldman Sachs probably had some of their interns or junior members pulling down all the data and building it up. And they're looking at $2.3 trillion of uh, money. Uh, and, and they looked at where this, this um, what's changed over the quarters. And there's some key interesting takeaways. Uh, let me just scroll a couple of things. Is one is that first of all, if, if you're down, don't feel bad because on average, the average hedge fund is down five percent year to date. Well, and that includes the short guys too. That's the other thing I want to point out. And maybe you were just going to do that. I mean, the average long hedge fund is down twenty nine percent. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so it's um, don't feel bad if you're if you're not. Um, you're not up. Um, there has been a, um, a, a a shift away from leverage and short interest. So hedge funds are becoming less bearish. Uh, in terms of major thematic tilts, there is a tilt away from a momentum stock versus growth stock. So I describe momentum stocks as, uh, well, a, a, a value stock is a company that based on its fundamentals uh, can rationalize the values that so you say the company earns, got a free cash flow, do discounted cash flow analysis. And you can say, uh, this is a value buying the stock lower than that, that value. A growth stock is one that's going to become a value stock. So right now might be getting a higher multiple. Historically, we think of something like Amazon, who Amazon is probably now more of a value company, always was a growth company. Today, maybe Twitter would fall in that category. Um, Tesla is certainly a growth stock and maybe now even approaching a value stock. Momentum stocks, I describe, as, <laughs> there's no reason for their prices to trend the way they're trending. And so, but sometimes, you know, it's it's fun to chase the lemming. So I don't know if you agree with that categorization, but I had somebody, uh, actually yesterday was in the Wall Street Journal and I was talking to the reporter and they asked me, uh, what is a momentum stock? So I- help them to understand that. No, I agreed with your 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 point you made in the Wall Street Journal yesterday. I, I read that article this, this morning. Um, and yeah, I, I do think there is a shift away from some of these high growth names into more value names like John Deere. Uh, we'll use that as our today's example of a stock that's um, not necessarily one of these companies that have led the market through the rally that we had from you know, 2015 to 2019, even up through 2021 for that matter. Um, well, that's, but, yeah. You mentioned um, Microsoft specifically, and, and that was one of the things that was sort of a shock to me is that Microsoft now is the number one holding a uh, long position among Mike's well, number one holding of all hedge funds. It, Amazon was number one. Uh, Uber and Netflix are still in the top five. Um, Meta fell down. Now let's let's scroll down and let me look. I want to look at that overall list because I I think it's fun to to look at. Um, where 
Uh, there we go. So I know this might be an eye chart for people, but we got Microsoft, Amazon, Google, Uber, Netflix, Visa, Apple, Meta, MasterCard, PayPal Holdings is the top 10 companies that are on here, big mega caps. Uh, just just for, out of interest. So down here at number, I think, 54 or 44 is Tesla. I'm a little surprised that's as low as it is. And I don't know, maybe I'm not, but I thought it was worth noting. But it's an interesting um, list of companies to look at here. So I just thought that was noteworthy and, and we wanted to share it with you folks here. Not that I necessarily see... Um, uh, any buy recommendations, but thinking in terms of this future that we have coming up with a uh, uncertain, with well, the known the known um, call of a recession that we're likely to have one. The question is how bad, and is it already priced in? Uh, at this point, I think it's not. Um, we know that we're going to have some rough seas, so I think from a portfolio selection, it's probably time to focus less on a company that might be a high growth, high risk stock. And you know, certainly don't go after YOLO stocks. And we're seeing major changes in cryptocurrency right now. And uh, YOLO companies like the meme stocks like AMD um, or Bed Bath & Beyond or some of those other ones. I think um, we're probably seeing a rationalized investor, retail and institutional focusing more on these big cap quality names that um, you know, Microsoft is pretty inflation resistant um, and, and economic uh, economically, you're still going to need to buy Microsoft office and people are buying Xboxes and, and other Microsoft products. So it's, it's interesting that Amazon has dropped down a little bit. Not that I'd be bearish on Amazon, but I think you could do worse than owning actually any of these top 10 companies. Speaking of YOLO, um, the uh, there's a conference this in the, in two weeks in New York. Um, it's a crypto conference. It's put on by Benzinga, and I know how long a conference takes to plan, especially these big ones. Um, you know, we're doing our options animal summit uh, here the the tenth and eleventh in Las Vegas, and you know it's not a massive conference like some of these other big ones, and it's still taking us months to plan. So this crypto conference that Benzinga's been sponsoring and you know putting out there and planning for probably well over a year the two headline speakers are kevin o'leary and anthony scaramucci oh, okay and i'm just like oh two guys that are directly tied to this F ftx blow up and then you know it's a whole bunch of other ones they've got a lot of other smaller presenters around the whole crypto world that i've never even heard of 90 percent of the companies that are there speaking. And I just thought, oh man, I know they are scrambling right now, but it's a, it's an industry that I still do not think we've found bottom in. I'm not saying that it's dead and that crypto will never live again, but I do think we're going to see a massive, massive amount of companies who will be shutting their doors over the next six to 12 months as we continue to see uncertainty in that whole speculative YOLO world of cryptocurrency. So I thought that there was a New York times conference, a very um, high level conference that um, that was out there. Um, it's like the Sone conference or something. I think, uh, I think Sam Blankman Frieden is still SBF still listed as an attendee. Um I don't know if that's going to change or not. I don't know exactly the conference, but that's possible. This one I'm talking about with uh, um, the Benzinga's running, it's actually sponsored by Deloitte as well. So they've got some big money behind it, uh, moving it. But man, it's the, the people they have on the list. I'm just like, oh, I, 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 anyway, we don't have to go down the rabbit hole of crypto here uh, and, and the risk there, but it's just a perfect example of you know, turning the clocks back a year ago or 18 months ago, everyone said, this is different. We're, we're in a new paradigm. And to me, I've said this before many, many times in conferences, you've probably heard me where I bring up the bubble chart and I talk about the implosion of a bubble. And at that peak, you always start to hear that term. Oh, it's different this time. And, you know, this is, uh, this is the future. And, 
It is. I'm not saying that's a bad, I think the blockchain technology is the future of online encrypted financial transactions. Um, but that doesn't mean that the, the, the old worlds of human behavior and economics change either. Those are the ones that I think are always going to stay steady. So anyway. Well, here's, here's, let me share this. What I was uh, noting was the New York Times deal book conference, which is next Wednesday. And so we've got Eric Adams, the mayor of New York, Ben Affleck, um, and then Sam Bankman Freed. And I don't know, who Jerry is, but uh, he's still showing up on the agenda. <laughs> this this was as of yesterday. He was still on the agenda. So, and this uh, this conference, by the way, is uh, Andrew Ross Sorkin is the organizer for. It. I think it's he usually does a really good job at it. So it'll be interesting to see if he's actually going to be there. Not it's this is just drama sort of stuff. If you ask me, it's well, you think horrible. Bankman Freed will be there? He's not going to show. If he comes into the United States, he's he will on, get arrested. He's on the agenda. This was yeah. yesterday. This was yesterday. Uh, ben put this out yesterday that he was he's still on the agenda. Maybe he'll show up virtually. There's no way he's coming. He, he'll get arrested. He should be arrested. The I, and you're you've got Ben Hunt up there. You've got uh, um, Epsilon Theory up there. You know he's been quote, saying in Twitter, "Why is this guy not in handcuffs yet?" And he, you know, references back to Bernie Madoff of, you know, the minute we, the day after we found out that Bernie Madoff was running his Ponzi scheme, he was in, he was in handcuffs and he was put in prison um, and didn't ever get out of prison again. And you know, obviously he died in prison, but it's been two weeks now that we've found out that this bankruptcy is happening and the fraud scheme is unwinding. And this guy's still out there walking around in the Bahamas or where he's at. Yeah. Yeah. There's been videos. I, it's, to me, again, this is drama um, sort of soap opera sort of stuff that doesn't really add any value. Um, it's not tradable other than well, may, maybe it was, I think if you're on the early side of it, maybe you should have been taking short positions and, the crypto for me, it's a warning right now. I've never really, I've never traded any of the crypto companies or the tr crypto exchanges. It's, it's from my opinion, it's baseball cards. I know you collect baseball cards. I don't have a problem with you collecting baseball cards. I have no opinion on it. So it's well, the same thing with crypto trading. I, I don't understand it. I'm not doing well, it. Well, let, let me, let me be very clear. And here's, here's the difference in my opinion on baseball cards versus um, financial. I don't collect baseball cards for their value. I, I, I collect it because I'm a Dodgers fan and I love baseball. And I, I, you know, as a little kid, I would read their stats because that was where I got their stats. I didn't have the internet to, to look at their stats every year. And so that to me was the world. So of that baseball. was the real reason to get access to the baseball cards. I, yeah. I think I admit to doing the same thing as, as a kid too, but I know I've, I, in the past, I've seen stacks of, uh, of baseball cards on your desk. Still haven't given up the habit, still enjoy buying baseball cards, but it has zero to do with it. I think they're going to be worth anything one day. So that, that's definitely where I would dis disconnect. All right. Before we wrap up, um, who do you have tomorrow? Oh, for football, huh? We got to tell you, it's, still, it's Turkey Day. We got to talk football. Yeah. So tradition, you know, the Lions are at home, Dallas is at home. And um, let's do one at a time. Okay. Bills, Lions. We've well, got nine and a half point Detroit. spread. So the, the Lions are getting nine and a half points. I will take the Lions with nine and a half points. Okay, I'm going to take the other side of that trade. I'm going Buffalo still. I think Buffalo is going to come away with the win. Okay. Uh, so Dallas is getting uh, actually nine and a half points as well. So I'm going to go with Dallas and nine and a half points, the home team. Oh, I think Dallas, Dallas wins that game, but I'm going to actually go with Giants with the spread. No, I'll no, take no. The other side the, I think Cowboys win, but I don't think they cover the spread. Okay. You don't think they'll cover the spread? So, okay. No. Nope. Yeah. So New York's getting eight, nine and a half. And then a closer game, uh, the Pats at the Vikings and the, um, yeah, the Pats are getting two and a half points. No, Minnesota's getting two and a half. Oh, right. sorry. No, no, you're right. You're right. I'm yeah. looking at it back. Yeah. New England gets yeah, two, and Pats are getting two and a half. Points. Yeah. Uh, Minnesota's favored by two and a half. I, I'm going Vikings on this one. Vikings as well. So for me, I'm picking all the home teams. I'm rooting for the home teams. I hope that all the fans 
have a really good day tomorrow. I'm actually not uh, doing turkey tomorrow. We're certain celebrating on uh, Wednesday because my daughter's a nurse. So oh. uh, I'll be uh, doing some yard work and prepping for. You're celebrating today. Tomorrow. Today's oh, Wednesday. I, did I say Wednesday? I mean, you said Wednesday. No, no. You're celebrating Friday. We're not celebrating Thursday. We're celebrating Saturday. I'm sorry. I'm oh, sorry. okay. Right. My brain is not connected. Uh, I'm like, you're doing this on worse. You're celebrating Thanksgiving. <laughs> no, uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. No, I'm, I'm celebrating on Saturday. So yeah, uh, I'm I'm gonna throw. Um, I think I'm looking at Tesla right now. Um, P ratio around 55, which is if you look at forward earnings, it's somewhere around 30. Uh, this is historical looking backwards, but looking at forward earnings. It's near an all-time low. I, th- I think if we look at a long-term chart on Tesla, um, it um, hasn't been here since 20. Uh, I'm actually long stock on Tesla right now. I think it's, a, I think it's, a, it's an attractive price point right now. Um, Do you know what? I'm going to agree with you. You were asking me before, what's my trade? And I'm you know, looking at things, and it's like there's a lot of stuff that's already run that I don't want to chase. Uh, I don't want to pick up oil right here yet. I'll pick it back up when it drops a little further, but I like Tesla right here too. So I'm going to go with you on this one. I like Tesla. I, I'm picking it up right here. I think it's a good bullish call. Yeah. I mean, maybe, you don't uh, have to, I mean, maybe doing a, a bull put spread or something. Yeah. Like that's what I was say, a bull maybe put, a covered call. Right so money. Maybe you don't just buy the stock. Maybe there's some trade there. It's got really high um, implied volatility. The part of the reason too, I think uh, the trade on uh, the, the, Twitter trade, as I heard, was bearish or buying puts on Tesla. So I, th- I think um, I- I'll go with uh, with with um, what's the name? Teal, Peter Teal. Peter Teal has a famous quote, and that is, "Don't ever bet against Elon." <laughs> so yeah, I, I, I'm a I'm a fan of Elon, but I I would go bearish on. I have traded Tesla bearish, so the stock is just a way for me to make money. I can separate the two. I I do think down here though, as um, we. Um, you got to be careful buying it at a 52 week low because who knows if the bottom can fall out of it, but I don't see any bearish catalysts. Um, I, I think this, the story is pretty positive, especially with the uh, inflation reduction act and getting some of the spending credits back. I think there's, you a- can get, you can get $2 out of a 175, 170 bull put for uh, the December $5 widespread $3 risk. That's a, yep. that's a pretty good deal. The December 16 options. So it's only what, three weeks. Yep. Um, and you can get it. Yeah. You can get $2 out of a $5 spread. That's actually a decent trade right there. Interesting trade. Well, hope everybody has a good uh, Thanksgiving. We'll look forward to seeing you. Are we going to do something on Friday? Maybe. I don't know. Uh, maybe we'll do some black Friday shopping. And, and by, by I'm saying that everyday trader, maybe I'll throw a couple stocks. It won't be a long one like this, but okay. I'm going to be at my parents' house. I can't even guarantee what they're, internet connection is going to look like. So maybe I'll be doing it from my cell phone. All right. Well, say hi to Larry and Pam for me. I will. Thanks, Eric. Have a happy Thanksgiving. Have a happy, happy Thanksgiving. Oh, by the way. So here, I just want to share some gratitude. And that is that I'm really thankful that I have um, the knowledge and the skills that I've had been able to learn through uh, options animal trading, because it is one of the things that is um, not so much. I mean, it, it, it's, it's removed a lot of stress, which has enabled me to be happier and focus on other things that are more important. Money is not the most important thing in my life, but certainly can be a stressor um, and being able to have the knowledge and comfort to be able to. Um, so it's a good time to share uh, my gratitude and appreciation. So, and you're a big part of that because you're the founder. Amen to that. Thanks, brother. All right. We'll talk to you later. See, See you. Ya.